Welcome to, to those of you who have joined uh, just now. Uh, my name is Miguel Herrero, uh, and I'm the uh, policy advisor for uh, buildings here at Soto Power Europe, and I will be the uh, moderator uh, for uh, this webinar. Today, we have an extremely interesting uh, agenda um, where we would like to explore uh, how solar energy and innovative business models uh, will help or are helping to overcome low electrification rates and poor access to electricity across the Sub-Saharan region, uh, issues around grid uh, reliability or how to ensure um, full access to to renewable energy uh, in light of low purchasing power. The uh, webinar will include uh, an input presentation from uh, Ali Yassir, who is a program officer on decentralized and renewable energy uh, at IRENA, uh, followed by uh, a presentation from Get Invest, uh, that will be given by Javier Ortiz Zuniga, who's a technical advisor at Get Invest which will be followed by a panel discussion uh, and Q&A with uh, you, the audience, uh, before closing off. Um, indeed, we will have a very, very distinguished uh, panel uh, speakers, uh, including uh, Ali Yassir, but also Karen Nyland from Get Invest, Leticia Dubois from uh, Actual, Rupesh Hindocha from Premier Solar, uh, and Rolak um, now the CEO of uh, Choberman uh, in Nigeria and until recently country manager for MPOCA um, for Nigeria as well. Just uh, a little piece of information for uh, the audience. Um, you can send us uh, written questions through the uh, GoToWebinar control panel. Um, which uh, looks uh, sort of like what you see on your screens. Um, you can just uh, type in your questions uh, within the text box and uh, I will receive it and uh, ask them on to the panelists. So without uh, further ado, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Ali Yassir for his presentation uh, on uh, decentralized solar PV and energy access. Uh, welcome, Ali. Thanks for joining us uh, from Dubai. Uh, the floor, you yeah, have the floor. And thank you. Thank you so much, Miguel. Um, pleasure to be here. And uh, technically, Abu Dhabi, not, not Dubai, but you know, still in the same country, the United Arab Emirates, from the uh, uh, headquarter of IRENA. So, um, uh, uh, like I said, it's a pleasure to be here, and you know, I'm really looking forward to a very interesting session. Um, so, uh, as and as uh, Miguel mentioned, I work at the International Renewable Energy Agency at the headquarters based in Abu Dhabi, uh, United Arab Emirates. Um, I work mainly, uh, you know, looking into decentralized renewables, um, and you know, Irina. Just very quickly, in case uh, some of you are not aware, is uh, an intergovernmental organization mandated to support uh, countries in their transition to sustainable to a sustainable energy future through widespread adoption of uh, and sustainable use of uh, renewable energy. Um, IRENA has near global membership with 163 full members and uh, another 21, uh, you know, on the next session and will be uh, full members hopefully soon. Yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So, uh, you know, uh, just as, you know, energy is, uh, you know, uh, an enabler for, you know, the overall socioeconomic development, uh, you know, decentralized renewables also, you know, they contribute to various, uh, you know, wider development agenda. And, uh, you know, they're, you can say they, uh, from, you know, the different uh, Nexi with, uh, you know, uh, health, uh, food, livelihoods. So you know, uh, there's a there's a very strong you say, link, interlinkage between decentralized renewables and the uh, and, and socioeconomic development. And uh, it is within this framework that you know uh, the that decentralized renewables, uh, you know, looking into both standalone 
uh, mini grid, uh, you know, both in the off grid as well as in you know uh, non off grid uh, situations, are sort of central to Irena's programmatic work, and they cut across. Uh, all areas of, uh, you know, pretty much all areas of Irina's work from, you know, uh, knowledge products, analytical work to, you know, country and regional engagement, uh, project facilitation, technical advisory, you know, and, and also, uh, you know, we have specialized uh, events and convenings on, on the topic of uh, off-grid renewables. And, uh, yeah, and, and you can say, and within Irina, uh, I would say that even though we cover all aspects from you know technology to policy, um, the greater focus on decentralized renewables, um, you know, is, is more in the context of uh, you know uh, ensuring or, or you know promoting access to energy and also you know as mentioned earlier the linkage with uh, the sustainable development goals and or you know, generally with the development agenda. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know there. There are a wide range of Irina's uh, publications and knowledge products that you know uh, uh, deal with uh, the topic of decentralized uh, renewables or off-grid renewables, and you know they range from you know policies and regulations to you know investments, uh, uh, you know job potential, gender, and as well as uh, you know uh, linkages linkages with uh, you know. Uh, priority areas such as uh, you know food and water and also humanitarian response and then healthcare. So um, since we're focusing more on uh, sub-Saharan Africa, I'll talk more about some of uh, you know the current ongoing work or recent work that Irina has done uh, within this you know the field of decentralized renewables that uh, you know has great relevance for sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the first of them I would like that I would like to talk about is in, within the context of the energy health nexus and, and particularly the nexus between I would say uh, you know off grid or decentralized renewables and and healthcare. Um, so you know, this is an issue that you know the or you can say the lack of energy in health facilities, uh, particularly in uh, you know rural areas uh, and then and, and you know a, a lot of them being in. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is, uh, you know, has come to the fore uh, during because of the ongoing pandemic. However, uh, I would say that, you know, for Irina, this issue has been the issue of, uh, you know, improving energy access uh, for rural healthcare has been in Irina's eyesight since, uh, I would say, 2017, 2018, when we convened um, an international conference on this issue. And, uh, Subsequently, you know, Irina has been working uh, with uh, has been working with uh, other institutions to sort of bridge the um, energy and health communities, and as a result, we're one of the founding partners and uh, you know permanent uh, steering committee members of the Glo of the World Health Organization led Global Health and Energy Platform for Action called HEPA, uh, which is also which is co-convened by UNDP, World Bank, and UNDESA. Uh, under the auspices of uh, the Global Health and Energy Platform for Action, Irina is supporting the development of uh, a global assessment of uh, electrification needs in healthcare. Uh, and we're also teaming up with the African Union Commission to advance uh, you know, renewable energy solutions uh, as uh, a con the continent's response to COVID-19 and, and generally you know, in terms of the recovery um, issues. And and I think I, I I won't get into the details, but you know I I think it's uh, you know energy is um, essential within the context of uh, of healthcare provision. I mean from you know types of services, you know from vaccine storage, which again would be a very important aspect going forward to uh, you know neonatal and maternal care, uh, you know surgery diagnostics, and then also you know for improving and maintaining hygiene, sourcing water um, to you know, management issues such as, you know, staff recruitment and retention, record keeping. So generally energy cuts across, you know, is, is essential for uh, proper functioning of health facilities. So uh, with that in mind, Irina has uh, recently started, uh, is engaging with uh, Burkina Faso uh, to carry out a sectoral assessment of electrification needs uh, in primary health facilities. So we're working both with the energy and health ministries of Burkina Faso. And the purpose of the uh, assessment is to firstly carry out a gap analysis looking into 
the you know technical, financial, uh, and policy gaps, but also um, you know looking into you know the on the institutional side, you know what what is needed uh, for the country to uh, electrify its health facilities. I mean, at the moment there are um, there's a large number of health facilities that are operating completely uh, you know in in the dark, so to speak. But then we also have um, several that. Uh, you know, either are, you know, served by, you know, an unreliable grid supply or where they do have some form of backup, but that is also proving to be inadequate. So, so what we've done as part of this assessment is that, you know, we, or what we are doing is to basically come up with a renewable energy based solution, which would serve as a blueprint, uh, you know, for, uh, for these facilities and that can then be expanded uh, across the country. Um, just to get a little bit into how we're going about this, um, as I mentioned, you know, we we kind of broadly divided into three phases. Uh, initially, you know, and and this is uh, you know the pre-assessment, which is where uh, we you know relied heavily on the health ministry for information to sort of understand the priorities and uh, you generally see the overall landscape of this, and also to select around a sample of around 50 something about 50 about between 50 and 60 uh, health facilities that would be uh, the sample size which for which there will be a physical inspection uh, on-site inspection and then based on this uh, you know the different um, the blueprint designs would be developed for uh, the existing as well as future uh, you know facilities to be constructed on the technical side, uh, we're also looking at, you know, in addition to the ener just the energy sourcing part, we're also looking at energy efficient at energy efficiency and you know optimizing uh, the design based on building uh, you know design elements as well as uh, you know the medical appliance use. And then finally, uh, you know, we would be using uh, the assessment and the uh, the assessment to come up with uh, you know actionable recommendations for the country. Uh, you know, uh, and you know, so so there would be, uh, as mentioned earlier, that the you can say the technical designs, but also, uh, you know, recommendations on business models, on delivery models that can be used, on uh, how uh, you know the country could uh, optimize its uh, you know public funding, but also uh, you know look into mobilizing additional resources. So you know, and and this work is currently ongoing and is expected to can uh, I would say towards the uh, mid of the second quarter of this year, uh, you know, we would be concurrently where uh, basically uh, in the assessment phase, the pre-assessment part has been done and uh, we're currently uh, in the process of collecting on-site on -site data. Uh, and, you know, yeah, and, and this work would be concluded, as I mentioned, in about, uh, uh, I think about mid, mid of the second quarter. And, uh, for, uh, and you know, this particular work stream, uh, you know, IRENA plans to expand this from Burkina Faso to other countries within Sub-Saharan Africa, but also, uh, you know, in, in small in the context of small island development states as well as other uh, LDCs. So this is a growing work stream of IRENA, and I think I believe that within uh, 2021 we would uh, initiate similar uh, sectoral assessments for electrification of health facilities in at least one or two more. Uh, uh, Sub-Saharan African countries. Um, then, as I'd mentioned earlier, uh, hinted at you know the importance of decentralized renewables in the context of humanitarian settings. Uh, you know, Irina has also worked with the UN Refugee Agency (UNHCR) uh, on, uh, and you know, at the moment globally, I mean, we have uh, perhaps the highest number of displaced persons ever, and uh, a staggering 90% are either without or have limited access to energy and because these uh, you know uh, settlements are uh, sort of uh, you know they, they come about as a result of an emergency energy is never really a former formal priority and because displaced persons and displaced settlements are seen as a transient uh, are seen transient you know uh, they, they often miss out from uh, country specific plans so, uh, <clears throat> so we uh, basically, so in our support to UNHCR, we carried out uh, the assessment in four uh, refugee settlements, two in Iraq and two in Ethiopia. Uh, we looked at different technology options from solar lighting, standalone solar, uh, solar water pumping, mini grids. And we also examined how, you know, some different 
delivery models such as leasing, PPAs, pay as you go, etc., could apply. And uh, so I, I would just get into the findings for Ethiopia uh, since we're talking about our Sub Saharan Africa. So, of the two camps that we uh, carried out the assessment in Ethiopia, uh, for one, it was grid connected and their main concern was on cooking fuel. So, I, I won't get into that. But for the other, uh, for, for the other um, uh, refugee camp, uh, you know, the main, uh, you know, based on our assessment on data collection of the needs of the, you know, the settlement, the, the refugee settlement, but also of the, you know, UNHCR and other agencies that are operating there, looking at community uh, uses as well, like schools, health clinics, uh, you know, the main, uh, the best solution that, that we sort of came up with for, for, for that settlement was uh, a mini grid. And, uh, you know, we in, in parallel, you know, we also looked into the possibility of uh, solar labs, uh, you know, they could also be introduced. And, uh, you know, uh, for the communal use, uh, solar powered street lighting uh, was, a, uh, you know, a key, you can say, a solution that could be used there. And finally, because of this camp's proximity to the grid, even though it did not receive supply, uh, you know, there was a possibility for uh, an application of grid connection for the settlements and also, in, you know, sort of having a, a, the mini grid or the, you can say, all, uh, within the, the solar installation within the fence to be connected to the grid. Uh, we examine how, you know, depending on the access to capital and the, uh, you can say, ability to commit because, we, again, it depends on how long the settlement is likely to stay you know, how different uh, delivery models such as, you know, a full PPA or a leasing or a purchasing, you know, what would be the best solution. So, but but certainly I think both in Ethiopia and Iraq, decentralized renewables, uh, you know, offered very, you know, various uh, solutions within the refugee context. I think I'll pause here and uh, I think, and then I'll be happy to take questions later on. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ali, for, for that presentation. Uh, very interesting indeed. We will be taking questions uh, during the panel discussion. Now, I would like to give the floor to, to Javier, a technical advisor at, uh, at Get Invest. Thanks um, uh, very much for, for joining us. Uh, do, do we have you uh, connected? Uh, there you are, Javier. Welcome. How are you doing? You're you're mute. There we go. Can you hear me now? We can hear you loud and clear. Thanks for joining, uh, Javier. Uh, you have the floor. Excellent. Thanks, Miguel. Uh, just let me see if I can get control of my slides. Yes, I can. There we go. So yeah, uh, as Miguel, as you pointed out, um, my name is Javier Ortiz, uh, working at Get Invest. Um, as a technical advisor managing the Get Invest Finance Catalyst uh, facility. So for those who don't know us, uh, very quickly, Get Invest, uh, we're a European program uh, specialized in uh, supporting investments in decentralized renewables. Uh, and uh, we are um, delivering on the priority initiatives of the European Union and its member states. And we're specifically supported by the European Union, Germany, Sweden, the Netherlands and Austria. The program is uh, implemented by GIZ and we are hosted on a multi-donor platform called GetPro. Uh, what is the, the program uh, about? So we're basically divided into two main uh, building blocks, two main components. One is called uh, private sector mobilization, which feeds into the second component, uh, pipeline development. Each component has a set of services. Uh, in private sector mobilization, we do things such as supporting events, such as the one today. Uh, we provide market information. And we also empower associations. We work with uh, the likes of uh, Solar Power Europe, uh, ARE, uh, GOGLA, but also uh, associations at national levels in the geographies that we cover. Uh, all those uh, services are uh, a vehicle towards uh, generating a pipeline for our pipeline development uh, component. In the pipeline development component, we have something called the Get Invest Finance Catalyst, uh, which in essence, uh, now I go to the next slide. In essence, it's a project preparation facility uh, whereby we help uh, project developers and companies uh, uh, access finance. Uh, so that is mostly debt and equity. It can also be grants uh, if it's the building blocks of complementary finance down the road. 
Uh, we are an honest broker, meaning we are not married to any financier out there. We work with all sorts of uh, financiers. It's an on-demand uh, driven facility. Uh, we do have a level playing field, a uh, transparent intake. Uh, we have an application portal uh, with uh, a set of questions, 25 to 30 questions. We try to make it relatively uh, easy and straightforward. We know that uh, companies, entrepreneurs are busy running their business. Uh, so we, we try to make it as, as simple as possible. What do we cover uh, in the in the Get Invest Finance Catalyst? So we cater for on-grid, off-grid, and also non-electricity. On-grid, it's a uh, small IPP. By small, we mean anything less than 50 megawatts. Uh, CNI, commercial industrial, also known as captive power. In the off-grid space, uh, we cater for mini-grids, uh, solar home systems, and also distributor of modern energy systems. And non-electricity, we do clean cooking, we do energy efficiency, and we've just started catering also for appliances. Uh, so companies specialize in developing appliances. Uh, this is a, a view of uh, our funnel on the left uh, side of the, of the slide. And this is just to show how drastic the journey to bankability is. It's a long process. On average, it takes two years for a company to get to financial close. And it's also not an easy journey. Uh, the the cloud the word cloud on the um, on the right side of the of the screen that is just uh, to show the multitude of different financiers that uh, that are out there in the market at the moment each with its specific modalities and that re really is the the raison d'être of of the facility you know it's really to to help uh, companies navigate these waters that are not uh, not easy and can be complex at times. Uh, as you all know, usually there's many financiers involved in one project, uh, and uh, we predominantly work with uh, dedicated financial instruments uh, for decentralized renewables, both public and, and private ones. Um, so here you can see a distribution of our portfolio by business model, technology, and region. Uh, IPPs, we started on strong with IPPs five years ago. Uh, but slowly and surely, uh, we see more and more um, captive power and, uh, and the distributor of energy systems on the rise. So applications and, and clients in our portfolio from those segments. Uh, in terms of technology, no surprises. Solar PV uh, takes the win. It's still the, the uh, least cost technology in the market. Uh, and in terms of uh, geographical distribution of our portfolio, uh, here, again, no surprises, Eastern and Southern African markets are the most mature. It is where we get the most traction. Uh, followed by Western Africa, and then Central Africa and Caribbean are still uh, markets that, uh, that are more a bit more earlier stage. Um, here, what we do want to want to note is that uh, we know that CNI is mainly to serve uh, corporate customers that are small to medium size. Uh, we do see a lot of developers that were previously focused on utility scale projects, uh, realizing that the utility space was uh, was facing obstacles and is still facing obstacles. Uh, these obstacles, for instance, uh, deficit on, on the utilities profit and loss accounts, uh, deficit in, in generation commission, commissioning, so new generation capacity, uh, and an increase in tariffs, but also accompanied by uh, a reduction in the cost of, of solar. Uh, this has allowed uh, these developers to move into the CNI space. Uh, we do note uh, that for us, the, 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 in the, based on our experience, the CNI space is currently the most viable uh, most commercial sectors, a uh, sector of the uh, market segments that we work with. In terms of uh, solar home systems, um, we see that uh, we define this as delivery of electricity to rural households and small businesses in rural and peri-urban areas. Um, and this is increasingly distributed with uh, pay-as-you-go uh, schemes, uh, also integrated with uh, mobile money uh, platforms. Uh, this presents uh, really an opportunity for a quick and effective deployment and, and outreach to remote locations. Uh, and we do consider this to be a niche. It's a very large niche. Uh, and uh, solar home systems, in our opinion, uh, maintains a competitive advantage over grid extension and other off-grid solutions such as mini-grids, especially when the target population is, uh, is remote, it's uh, low density and, and rural. And even, even in peri-urban areas with low density and uh, not good road infrastructure, it could uh, make sense. Uh, now I'm gonna present to you two case studies uh, so, uh, of companies that we've been supporting over the years. Uh, the first one is in Sudan. It's a local uh, corporation, uh, Hagar, who has partnered with a Dutch uh, solar de developer called Photon Energy. 
and also with a Swiss company called Energy Vault. And uh, all three together, they're developing this uh, solar PV uh, CNI project, uh, which uh, has a, a groundbreaking uh, storage, uh, uh, new storage solution, and uh, can supply uh, uh, power to um, to uh, uh, irrigation for irrigation purpose to a GLB farm. Uh, it's a growing agribusiness uh, located uh, 100 kilometers north of uh, of uh, Khartoum, which is the capital of Sudan. And here, really, the the challenge in this one was really. Uh, Sudan is a, is a high-risk environment, as you all know, uh, which is undergoing political change. And uh, this is considered uh, a barrier for investment by many investors, so it was not easy to pitch it. Uh, but besides the complex uh, governance aspects, um, we also note that GLB Farm was the sole off-taker, so uh, there was no risk diversification. All the risk was absorbed by one single entity. And this also was a bit of a concern uh, that we needed to, to solve. Uh, and in that regards, our support really was geared towards improving the business case uh, of, the, of the company, but also helping them uh, with the financial structuring so as to meet uh, international um, project finance standards in that sense. Uh, so a lot of the work was, uh, because it was only one off taker, um, we needed to really work on the assumptions, uh, make sure that we accounted for most of the risks in the financial model. Uh, and so that was, a, that was a big exercise that our advisors did. Uh, the results that are obtained is that this transaction now it's on, the, on, on its way to financial close uh, with an investment volume of approximately 36 million euros uh, for the solar PV and storage components in the first phase. There's gonna be a second and third phase if I'm not mistaken. Um, the estimated impacts, uh, it's 20 megawatts of installed uh, capacity, 40 megawatts hour of storage. Uh, and obviously the, the project will help uh, uh, create uh, direct and indirect jobs, uh, help uh, food security in the region, uh, stimulate the, the, the local, the regional economy, uh, as well as increase uh, exports of, of, the, of, the pro of the produced crops. The next um, example is, um, it's a Pago solar uh, distributor. It's uh, called Upova. Uh, it's a French Cameroonian based developer that, that reaches the last mile customers. Uh, here, the, the challenge really is, uh, really was uh, and is because we're still supporting them, uh, coming up with a strategy for accessing additional equity and grant with the objective of scaling up uh, Upova's model. Uh, but also to introduce new activities in the company. Uh, the support that we offer through the Get Invest Finance Catalyst advisors, and one of those advisors will indeed be in, in the panel later on, uh, Carolyn, uh, was really around the business case uh, and, and filling in the gaps uh, in the financial model once again, to make sure that the model spoke the same language as, as that of the financiers. Uh, but beyond closing the financial gap, uh, we also helped Upova um, uh, recruit uh, a CFO because it was facing some challenges to find a, a, a skilled uh, local CFO. So we also help them in, in the recruitment process there. Uh, in terms of results achieved here, uh, Upova uh, successfully uh, raised finance uh, from Electrify, which is one of the financing instruments that we work with. And this really has allowed the company to boost uh, distribution of, uh, of solar home systems in the country. Uh, they've connected over 165 people so far to clean power. Uh, and now the company is preparing for a new uh, round of equity raise, uh, which uh, hopefully will enable for expansions of its operations. Uh, really, the company's goal is to reach 1 million people and create 1,000 direct jobs, thereby also uh, helping the, 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 the local economy in the, in the region. No? So that's uh, the, the two case studies. Uh, this is again a reminder if you're a project developer and company listening to us uh, today, if you wanna apply, uh, here's the direct link. Obviously we, we have NDAs in place and, 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 and such things. Um, if you want uh, to have an introductory call, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, my email is uh, here on the sli last slide, uh, uh, preferably by email, but if it's very urgent, you may also contact me on my mobile phone. Uh, and yeah, uh, that's it from my end. Uh, thanks very much, Miguel, and looking forward to a, to a fruitful uh, panel discussion. Thank you very, very much for that, uh, Javier, and it's a very interesting presentation. 
and I very much liked your two your two case studies, which we will uh, discuss a little now uh, in the panel discussion. Um, so now I would like to invite uh, all the, the panelists to, to join me on on our screens um, by turning on your your uh, webcams for yes a one hour panel discussion around uh, the uh, topic of on site. Uh, solar and sustainable electrification. Um, for the first part of this of this panel, I, I want to maybe ask uh, for each of you to, to react to, to the input uh, presentations. And I would like to start with, uh, with you, Rolake. Um, you were the country manager in Nigeria for, for MCOPA, pioneer of the pay-as-you-go uh, business model uh, in Africa. And uh, yeah, I wanted to get a feeling of uh, what uh, your assessment is of the, of the Opoa project uh, in Cameroon and, and whether or not this is a similar, the experience of the Opoa project is similar to what you, you experienced in, in Nigeria. I mean, particularly, I was wondering if you uh, also had tr any troubles accessing uh, uh, financing for your uh, operations. Okay. Hi, um, thanks, Miguel. I'm very happy to be here this morning. So as you said, I used to be the country manager for MCOPA Solar in Nigeria. I've um, recently taken on a new role as CEO of Jobberman just two weeks ago. Um, Jobberman is the largest online um, platform for jobs in sub-Saharan Africa, doing recruitment and also training. Um, however, I also sit on the board of the Renewable Energy Association of Nigeria, which is the industry body that all or most of the renewable energy and solar companies are part of in Nigeria. So I'm still going to stay involved in the pay-as-you-go space and the solar space because um, it really is close to my heart. So back to your question regarding um, Opower um, and um, thanks um Javier for the intro on what op I was up to in Cameroon so um to give you some ideas of how that differs or is similar to MCOPA MCOPA is, was the pioneer of the solar home system space so MCOPA started about um 10 years ago in East Africa so you know you asked what were the issues finding finance to expand into Nigeria so I'll say that for MCOPA since it's been around for so long um you know, there was quite an established company already. However, coming into a new market where the solar home system and um, pay-as-you-go market is still being tested, um, MCOPA actually secured funding um, through um, the UK DFID um, Solar Nigeria Fund um, to begin a pilot in Nigeria. So it was actually that funding um, that started off the business here and enabled MCOPA to do the product market fit testing, understanding what customers really want, what size of systems do they need, and even doing the research into who are the customers who need solar, where in Nigeria are people most affected by a lack of electricity, and um, where are the customers who are open to take on such a novel and different um, technology, because solar in Nigeria is quite new and there has been a legacy of people saying oh solar doesn't really work or oh, the chinese brought in some you know solar street lights like 20 years ago and they didn't work so well so there, there, there's a bit of a negative feeling about solar but i have to say that over the last three years it's a sector that's really growing here um, and so in comparison to, um, to up power, I'll say that yes, some similar um, challenges. Um, however, because um, MCOPA was a known name that helps us and because of the success in East Africa, and um, we were able to secure the Solar Nigeria funding for the pilot, which is from the UK government. And since then also secured funding from the World Bank and the um, Nigerian um, Rural Electrification Agency. Um, the NEP, which is the Nigerian Electrification Project, which is a $60 million fund um, to expand solar across rural areas in Nigeria. And also, and COPA has also been successful in the REACT fund from the African Development Bank. Um, yeah, so it's my, my first um, comments. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Rolake. Uh, for that uh, very good overview of uh, your time at uh, MCOP and the, and the challenges you encountered. Maybe uh, I would like to ask uh, Caroline uh, now to, to give us a little bit uh, more, more insights, as soon as you were very involved in the uh, power project. Um, did, you, did you inspire yourselves uh, with, uh, with the MCOPA experience at all? Did you try to do some things uh, differently? 
how how is that project uh, going yes uh, good morning everybody good morning uh, uh miguel thank you so much for this opportunity um well you know i'm always uh, I, I read a lot of literature i'm always uh, trying to learn from other business models uh, not only pay as you go but also fee for service and a cash model well different cash uh, different business model that allow uh, me to uh, improve the operations yes in the past i've been uh, setting up a lot of uh, distributed energy companies and um, in many countries in africa um, and um, not only uh, we could raising the funds for these companies but also uh, trying to reach operational excellence and financial viability of these companies. And, um, you know, when I, uh, indeed, MCOPA is, is a successful uh, business model, uh, but there are some others. Like uh, Javier also said, UPOA is also very, uh, an excellent company doing a great job in uh, Cameroon, where four in five households are not connected to the grid. Uh, so, uh, you know, all these, I always say, all these different business models are needed uh, because there are so many people still not uh, connected uh, to the grid. And uh, every business model uh, brings its own uh, challenges, and but also its own uh, benefits. And I think that's the, that's the, 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 the beauty of uh, device, device, diversity of, um, of, uh, of business models and type of energy companies. And um, uh, myself, uh, when I uh, set up all these companies in the past, uh, these DESCOs in, in different countries in, in, uh, in Africa, we, used, uh, we were using the fee-for-service business model. Um, so that allows us to uh, set up a Thanks. lot of uh, mini grids. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, we'll, we'll, yes. we'll get into the Descos and all and your magnificent Desco experience uh, later on in the in the panel. Yeah. But uh, thanks a lot for your your insights on the on the Payco uh, model. Um, I would like to now to to uh, also uh, have a look at the, the the other major segment that we are trying to look at uh, during our discussions uh, today, and that's the the CNI. Uh, sector and i mean we we heard from uh, from javier that uh, um this is uh, probably the the most uh, viable uh, space for for uh, on-site uh, solar or for solar in, in sub-saharan africa uh today um rupesh what do you think about about this uh, is this uh does this ring true for for you and, and can you tell us a little bit uh, about your your thoughts regarding the uh, Hagar uh, project in in um, Sudan? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I'll start with uh, with Miguel's question with regards to on-site or CNI solar in general. I think you've seen from the previous two uh, presentations the various applications that that solar now has in in be it remote areas or even areas where the grid exists everything from solar street lights to to solar household systems um and of course we now have the emergence in africa of of the large ipp solar parks as well in between sits the on-site generation or c and i solar market um it caters to a wide variety of applications everything from where a grid doesn't exist um to where a grid is rel um, relatively unstable and therefore there's a large requirement for usually diesel generation backup um, to where there is a grid, um, but solar being the least cost option uh, allows companies to to reduce their uh, their cost of power. Um, we see all of those three applications across the markets that we cover, um, and I think uh, during Javier's uh, presentation, he quite rightly said that one of the the positives of the Hagar project is increased food security, uh, employment, um, uh, and I think that's what we see across the, the sectors that we cover. With regards to the Hagar project uh, itself, I'm not aware of the, uh, the sort of minute details of the project, but as Javier said, it's 20 megawatts of solar and 40 megawatt hours of, of battery or, or storage, I should say, and I think that's the key. We all know that solar is an intermittent um, generation of power. 
um, solar, wind, etc. We know it has that problem. And I think the advances that we're seeing globally in various storage uh, products is the key to how this market will continue to grow. So Hager's using gravity. We, um, we're using lithium. Um, there are molten salts being used. Um, there are various companies working on various technologies, but I think that's going to be the defining moment for on-site generation to really scale up across sub-Saharan Africa. I see, uh, and I very much your, your reference to, to, to storage. Uh, I maybe wanted to, to know a little bit more because I know that you have uh, worked with Get Invest uh, yourself and developed the projects with them. Can you tell us about uh, your experience uh, and how they, they helped you? Sure. Um, we were lucky enough to, to meet Get Invest just over 14 months ago uh, during a European conference when we still had real conferences. Um, and um, Javier was the point of contact. We, we quickly moved over, as he said, to NDAs. We were looking to raise some equity. We already had proof of concept and had been around in, uh, in Kenya for three years now, done several projects and reached a break even point. So they were very quick in, in onboarding us, um, reviewing our financial models and pitch decks. But if you don't have them, I know for a fact they work very hard with their, with their team to, to help you build financial models and pitch decks. If you already have them, they help you audit them. And then the next step was reaching out to the plethora of investors that they're in touch with. They do sit with you before that and really find out what you're looking for and then really target the correct investor base so that you're not pitching uh, equity to a debt investor or vice versa. Um, they're with you all the way through that. We, we, they helped us raise equity even during the COVID period. Uh, and most recently, earlier this year, they've now um, assisted us on getting on track to raise some debt as well. So invaluable uh, opportunity that we found with Get Invest, um, very easy to deal with and, and very understanding. As Javier said, is uh, entrepreneurs are busy trying to actually run the business. So, um, you know, they take that pain away and they do realize that uh, we have other things to do. So they really do hold your hand all the way through. Sorry, it was muted. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. A very, very interesting uh, experience, and good to know that uh, they were very helpful. I mean, uh, part of the the reason is we want to raise awareness uh, for mm -hmm. Get Invest uh, uh, offerings. Um, I mean, in, in in light of this, uh, Leticia, I, I would like to to hear from you as well. Uh, I mean, you, you're a business developer at uh, Aqua, a European uh, IPP with a strong development strategy. Uh, across uh, Africa. Um, how do you see the, the, uh, the CNI uh, market segment and, uh, and where, uh, can you tell us a little bit of where Aqua sees the most opportunities? Sure, thanks Miguel and, and nice to uh, meet you all today. Um, so yeah, Aqua is, uh, is not focused on, on a B2C uh, and uh, we, we more focused on the B2B uh, business model. So that's a bit different from, from what we said before. Um, we are, I would say we are targeting two types of clients. Uh, first one is uh, the grid operators on, on the one hand, but that's not the today's topic. And the other, the other one is the private sector. So notably the, the commercial and industrial sector, uh, meaning uh, mining sector, hospitality sector, salmon plants, etc. So we usually offer them to have uh, on-site uh, embedded generation from either solar or uh, solar combined with storage, as we, we previously said. Um, yeah, they can be either grid connected and then you help them uh, reduce their, their electricity bill or anything else we can discuss after, or they can be fully off grid uh, running on, on TSL generators usually. And, um, and in terms of business models, we can offer, um, I would say if the client agrees to invest, which is not often the case, uh, he can simply purchase the plant and own in and operate it. Uh, at the opposite, you can sign the, a power purchase agreement with, with the client and then uh, it's only on, on its OPEX or anything hybrid such as a leasing agreement, for instance, we see more and more leasing agreements or any, any kind of energy services agreement de depending on how you, you manage to price your service. 
Super. Uh, very, very interesting, uh, Leticia, and that you're also uh, highlighting the the uh, embedding of uh, of solar solar in your in your uh, in your projects. Um, there was, uh, I have a follow up question for you actually because uh, I mean uh, it was mentioned also before that uh, there are a lot of uh, difficulties in developing uh, utility scale projects uh, in Africa. Is that also true from your experience? Um, you mean utility scale or, or for the CNI? Yes. For the CNI, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think the the um, the three main challenges we encounter. Uh, first one, I, I would say, is the the pedagogy. You you usually have to display uh, when it comes to the CNI sector. There is some kind of uh, fantasy around solar, like people see uh, tariffs made public in the news and imagine you can just put one PV panel on your ground and uh, get electricity at almost zero cost. Um, so I think we need uh, to teach, we need to explain what is behind the tariff, for instance. Uh, you have a capex an opex a financing scheme taxes insurances etc so the first one is is the pedagogy you have to to display um this which is not the case with with grid operators obviously uh, the second one i think is is the time horizon um when you talk about solar you want to sign contracts over let's say 20 20 years uh, minimum uh this is the basically the average uh, life of your assets uh, but 20 years for a uh, commercial and industrial sector is too far away. Uh, they have business plans over three to the next three to five years maximum, and they are reluctant uh, to sign agreements over 10 years. Uh, this is, for instance, the case for the mining sector, where uh, the life of mine is the critical element to determine how over how long uh, can the shareholders commit uh, the mine on any agreement. Um, and and the third one is the financing um you usually need to leverage your project uh, with some depth if you want it, if you want it to be competitive uh but the banks uh then require uh securitization mechanisms such as parent company warranty letter of credit escrow account and that are things that the cni clients are not necessarily happy to provide Interesting. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for those uh, additional insights. And and in fact, this uh, this uh, your your mention of uh, of the the time horizon and and you know the the, the difference between the the business plans or of, of uh, potential clients and the lifetime of a of a solar uh, plant or installation is quite uh, interesting. I mean, I think that uh, Caroline, um, we've heard uh, from your colleague Javier about uh, getting better activities uh however I'm, I'm aware that you're you're involved in in uh in a study uh regarding the mining sector uh in in uh, sub-saharan african country can you tell us a little bit about about that and, yeah. and do, does it does the what leticia was mentioning uh, also ring a bell yes uh what leticia say really rings rings a bell um, I'm not uh, involved in a study on the mining sector specifically. No, I'm uh, 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 doing a, a market study in the renewable energy sector in the DRC. But what I discovered is that, well, we all know that uh, the DRC only has 9%, well, between 9% and 20% of uh, energy access. Uh, it's not clear what is the official uh, numbers. But uh, there's only an inst a capacity, installed capacity of 2,000, let's say 3,000 megawatts uh, in the country, and of which only 13, uh, thousand, uh, 13 uh, I think, uh, 2,000, uh, 2000 is uh, really operational. So um, there is a very huge opportunity for on-site, uh, for all kind of uh, energy access uh, solutions as it can be uh, mini grid operations it can be pay as you go uh, with pico systems but at the same time uh, the mining companies uh, are also uh, looking more and more into solutions for um, uh, energy uh, solar plants for example solar plants uh, there are thousands of mines uh, mine sites uh, in the drc waiting uh, to uh, replace their diesel generators uh, with uh, solar solutions. 
uh, they are still reluctant uh, to look look, look it into it uh, because, like you say, you have to go into sometimes in a PP, PPA uh, uh, kind of uh, procedures uh, to get uh, power. Uh, and at the same time, when you, I think an important thing is what I say is, uh, and, and that's not only the, the mining industry, but also the telecom industry, when you want to supply power to uh, tower companies, um, tower, uh, telecom towers, you have to think that uh, when they, they used to uh, use uh, diesel generators, that's a short term expense. And uh, it's an expense for a short term. But when you uh, decide to go for a solar plant or solar solution, then uh, you have to um, replace it. Uh, you, you have, let, let's say, you have to think of 25 years of de depreciation. So it comes into your balance sheet. It comes on the long term. So it's another way of looking at the business. And um, at the same time, uh, mining industry do not always have the land uh, available for big uh, energy uh, plants. Um, um, and, and indeed, when you, for example, when you go into um, um, uh, an agreement with uh, telecom towers, uh, they often tend to choose for a PPA. Uh, they don't want to be uh, to have an own. They don't want to own uh, the solar plants. They want to have a company that uh, um, operates and manage and maintain uh, the energy solution. So then you have to go into the PPA. And like Leticia said, uh, it's a it's really a, a difficult thing to sign a PPA because a lot of legal uh, aspects come into uh, the reality. And I know a lot of projects which are trying to, since two, three years, to sign a PPA to get a letter of credit um, uh, because you want, as a company who provides the energy, you want to be protected for the fact, uh, for a risk that you might not be uh, paid. So you would like to have, for example, a letter of credit. So, and it seems in reality, all these aspects and legal aspects are not easy to uh, to uh, find uh, as a solution. So they are, uh, it's, it's another, for on-site, uh, there are still a lot of aspects uh, that can be uh, improved. And also from a regulatory and tax systems in the countries. Interesting. And uh, thanks uh, for already advancing uh, maybe couple of the the solutions to to the challenges which we are uh, all identifying uh, now maybe uh, I would like to to move to to the next uh, phase of the of the of the panel where indeed we will uh, try to discuss the the solutions to to these uh, these challenges and in indeed the pedagogy the time horizon uh, the cost of financing the um, all these, I mean, uh, are addressed by by these uh, innovative uh, business models, and I and I think I would like to start off with uh, Rupesh uh, um, and your your own experience uh, in developing, notably um, the largest rooftop uh, solar project uh, in in Kenya, but also the Naivasha uh, project as well uh, in Kenya. Um, what why was solar chosen for for these uh, projects and why was it optimal and and did you um, how did you resolve uh, the issues around the working with the clients and and uh, you know maybe problems signing the PPAs or or the cost of financing? Sure, thank you. I think as Letitia said, I think it starts with C and I very much is dealing with a corporate customer rather than a grid operator. Uh, and it comes through education. So there was, um, when we entered Kenya, there were a lot of legacy issues in the minds of the corporates, at least with regards to systems that had failed. Um, sometimes they weren't actually related to solar PV, they were related to solar water heating, but it's got the word solar in it, and therefore uh, it had a negative connotation. Um, that, that, that sort of was relatively easy for us. We already operated in, in Dubai, Sri Lanka, and India. Um, so it was a case of, of speaking to the right sort of like-minded clients and, and getting around that issue. And then it, I think, comes to, to listening to the client. So I think the panelists, several of the panelists have talked about 
DPAs versus operating lease versus the not so often case of an outright purchase, but you need to listen to the client and, and clients in East Africa per se um, do struggle with PPAs. They do like a, a, an ownership of all assets. Um, most of our customers are agricultural and or, or industrial and therefore they've already had factories or farms for 30, 40, 50 years. They're less transient in nature. Um, and so we set about working on um, an operating lease uh, and a loan structure, an asset finance structure to optimize the, the outcome for the client and get them to the lease cost option utilizing taxes available, et cetera. Um, once we got over those hurdles and the first few early adopters uh, gave us the projects, uh, ever since then it's been a, it's been a momentum play. Um, more and more people in the C&I sector are seeing solar spring up, um, are frustrated with the utilities uh, costs of power, uh, and especially post COVID um, are under no option but to look at reducing operating expenses. So, you know, we've seen a, a, a very large sort of play on the momentum of that. Um, so getting around that, yeah, I mean, you talked about the, the largest project and when we first showcased that project, it, by the time it's completed, it would have been the largest project in, in East Africa at 1.9 megawatts. We're already working on a six megawatt rooftop project. So by the time that's completed, and these things change all the time, obviously. Um, but as I said, adoption is there. I think storage, as we spoke about earlier, is helping. Um, clients want to reduce um, not only their daytime usage, but their, their nighttime usage as well, which we can't do with solar alone. Um, clients are looking for solutions to unreliable power as well, which, which storage is helping. So, And then I think clients expect us to work around their processes. So the, uh, so the transaction in Nivasha, is, is definitely Africa's, but I believe one of the world's only hybrid solar and geothermal plants, um, and they expect you to be able to, to meet their requirements, which was to hybridize the two, or as I said, meet UPS functions or emergency backup functions. So I think once you, you meet those barriers, then the only sort of barrier left is, is, is policy and government that is really lacking in uh, it, across the region. I think we're going to get to it uh, in a while, but I think Caroline mentioned taxes. Um, it's something that was introduced recently in Kenya that really hit the solar household system more than the C and I sector. But these sort of policy changes, um, for whatever reason, whether it's revenue collection or to or to defend a, a parastatal, can obviously uh, cause you great slowing down of your of your business. But that aside, from uh, from a client side, I think it's up to us as industry pra uh, practitioners to to listen to the client and, and, and meet and hopefully try to meet their requirements or explain why they're not reachable. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot for, for that overview, uh, Rupesh, and uh, um, very good to, to know that you're already working on a, an even bigger rooftop uh, project. Uh, I look forward to, to hearing more about, about that uh, when it is uh, completed. And indeed, I mean, I think we, we will get into that uh, later on but uh, policy and government uh, is, uh, as in Europe, actually, uh, always uh, one of the most important uh, um, barriers to the further integration of the energy system and the deployment of, uh, of renewables. Um, turning back to the uh, household uh, sector and, and, the, and the PAYGO uh, model, Rolak, I mean, there is this understanding that renewable energy is, is uh, somehow uh, Difficult to to acquire for those at the the with the lowest purchasing uh, power. How how can we we uh, avoid this through microfinancing and by leveraging microfinance? Uh, thanks, Miguel. Um, just before I answer your question, to follow up on what Rupesh was saying about um, the preference of many clients in PPAs and similar to what Leticia was also talking about i mean it's the same thing that we're seeing here in nigeria when you're looking at the larger clients telecoms banks um there are players such as star sites solar in nigeria dubai leave very various players here and very much that is a model that is um preferred um so back to households uh back to the bottom of the pyramid um or really we should just call it the mass market because it is the majority of people living in our country. So it's not really the bottom, it's just the majority of people. 
Um, and yes, there is a perception that it's hard for them to get onto the solar ladder because of the perceived cost of solar. Um, but as we've all seen on this panel in the last um, decade, um, the increase in um, solar technology um, has meant that the costs have come down. And the whole model around pay as you go solar means that we can find ways to make that even more accessible for those with um, a lower income. So the whole concept of the pay as you go solar model is that a customer can pay for their product over time. So as Caroline also spoke about, um, we often pitch a solar home system in comparison to the next best alternative. So here in Nigeria, where you have 70% of the population who live in the dark, um, and then you know the other 30% are living with not up to 24 hour lights. Um, we are forced to use um, generator systems, which can be powered by diesel if it's a larger system, or powered by petrol if it's a one kVA to like a five kVA system. So when we go out and we speak to people who um, don't have electricity, we explain to them that if you purchase a pay-as-you-go solar model, what you can do is pay a little bit upfront, and then we will enable you to make micro payments over the next one year or two years or three years, rather than you purchase a generator, you put down the cost of the generator, the full amount today, you, ha you have to pay it all off, and then um, you have to keep buying your fuel um, every couple of days. Um, so really the payment space is actually a major driver of the solar home system space. And one of the reasons why Nigeria was later to the game in solar home systems was because many of these companies were coming from um, Kenya and Uganda, um, companies like Mkopa or Phoenix or um, Greenlight Planet or D-Light. And in West Africa, there wasn't yet the infrastructure of digital payments. So there's no m -Pesa here. Um, you don't have your mobile phone to just make you know, a 50 cent payment in Nigeria. However, you know, this sector is growing extremely fast. And when I say there's no mobile payments, I mean it in the strictest term um, of mobile payments in um, the, the theory. But of course there are companies um, like Interswitch or um, Paga, um, even Paystack, which are um, developing more and more technologies which enable small payments that are not too high a cost for the customer. So um, yeah, in answer to your question, um, what we were doing at Encopa was leveraging partners, leveraging partners such as InterSwitch, their quick teller system, which allows a customer to pay by USSD or online, um, leveraging partners um, like Paystack, which also allows customers to pay um, in small amounts and then collecting that payment over time, which means that a customer, when they're presented with a product that's you know a thousand US dollars, and their salary per month is maybe 500 US dollars, they can still access it by just putting down a down payment of about 50 US dollars and then making a micropayment on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, whatever um, suits their pocket. Thank you, uh, Rolake. Um, a quick question, I mean, uh, how long do, does your average uh, customer take to, to repay their uh, um their solar home system just to clarify again so i'm now i'm ceo of job so i'm no longer in yeah. Copa, but the average customer there was taking um so we, the solar systems at mcopa were three year initially and then we did a lot of um customer surveys to understand if that really made sense and our understanding was that the nigerian customer prefers to own their products it's quite different to the mentality in kenya where credit is a bit more established and they're not worried that you're gonna take them to court if they don't pay back whereas in nigeria we really had to do a lot of work educating customers that we want to be flexible with you we want you to enjoy the products and um, appreciate the product without being scared about not paying back the loan um, what we did see is when we introduced a payment scheme which meant there was a discount for paying off the product earlier customers paid it off faster so um, so on the run rate of the um, rate of payments coming in I would say that the fastest customers who would pay off this three-year loan would probably be in about um, two years and then we did also introduce a price point at um, a one-year plan and there was a small segment of the customer base that paid so I'd say let's say 10 percent but it's a completely different customer segment to the mass market it was people who were buying it 
for you know maybe a spare room in the house or a, a house a little house or um shed at the back of their compound so it was a higher income customer that was paying it off faster i see um very interesting to to learn that uh, you were also needing to, to educate your your customers much like uh, our colleagues here are working on the larger scale uh projects uh and i mean i think in the end you you, you hit the nail on the head uh, uh with the pg model i mean it's making solar accessible to to all and i think i mean i would want to, to maybe have the the uh, views of, uh, of Ali, uh, thanks again for your, your presentation earlier. I mean, here, when we're talking about access to, to energy, we're really in the, in the you know, realm of the, uh, the SDGs. And I mean, in your view, I would like to know how, how the private sector can be enhanced to, to address you know, these issues of access to, to energy, but also with regards to other development uh, areas. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, well, uh, you know, some of these development areas, you know, and particularly the two that I gave an example of, you know, the health services and the uh, revenue and the uh, humanitarian settings. I mean, they're not, in particularly health services in most developing countries, it's, it's a non-revenue generating kind of a sector. I mean, you know, uh, the bottom of the pyramid or, you know, in, in that last mile segment, uh, people aren't really charged for their health service, so it's it creates quite a bit of issues as you know what would be the best uh, you know modality and and that is why you know also learn, you know bring uh, bringing in some of the experience that we're getting getting from uh, the work in Burkina Faso uh, a very critical aspect of this is the ownership structures you know typically for a household or a CNI uh, market segment you know it's very clear who the owner is who's responsible who pays and you know who takes the financial risk over here, when you're talking about, you know, these critical services, uh, you know, having a proper uh, ownership structure and sort of, uh, because a lot of this is dependent on public funding. So, you know, uh, there are, you can say, um, examples and also, you know, you can say entry points for the private sector, uh, you know, for large health facilities, for larger health facilities, rather, you could, you could look into, you know, energy services, energy supply contracting, either through a PPA or, uh, like you know, you have the example from emerging from Kenya, where under the Kenya uh, the Kenya off uh, off grid solar access project, you know it would be the uh, energy utility that will be owning the uh, standalone system that would be on you know supplying energy to a health facility, and the health facility would be paying tariff like any customer of the utility. So you know you've got, but you know but under that scheme. Uh, the utility company would be tendering to private companies to have long-term PPAs, to have long-term operation and maintenance contracts, because that really, uh, you know, has a very critical role uh, in these projects. Uh, you know, you may find some funding for the initial setup. What happens, you know, a few years down the road when batteries need to be changed? You know, who is responsible for making sure that these systems, you know, are up and running at all times? So, you know, we uh, and then. Um, I, I wouldn't take, I, I wouldn't name the countries, but this is also an example from Sub-Saharan Africa uh, within the refugee setting, uh, just to give an indication that, you know, uh, solar is highly feasible uh, within that space. Um, you know, I mean, there is an example, I mean, like I said, uh, it's a particular refugee camp in a location, which is the conflict area. You know, you have a lot of logistical challenges and you have a large refugee settlement running on diesel. And uh, you know uh, where the, the the refugee camp is running on diesel, and in order to get uh, diesel transported, you know diesel arrives at a port in at a country. It's transported by road to the border of this conflict free country, from where it is airlifted to arrive at the refugee camp. So if you can imagine the cost and the you know the, log the logistical challenges with that, certainly solar is hugely you know uh, is a, is an excellent solution there. However, the challenge that you face there is uh, a lot of these settlements are in theory transient and they're not permanent settlements. You know the funding that refugee agencies are receiving to sort of uh, you know uh, maintain these these uh, sites is all you know they're they're kind of on one year two year basis. So how do you, how so you know the 
uh, it, it, the challenge for them is not so much that you know uh, they would they can not use solar, but it's mainly how do you justify using solar, which would pay back in a long, you know, maybe in three to four years for a settlement that is only in theory supposed to last for a year. In practice, they end up lasting for a lot longer, making so. So in this particular aspect, you know, again, there are different. I think there are a lot of uh, private companies that are being contracted to now. Uh, provide uh, you know solar solutions in the humanitarian space, but you know over there we're looking at you know uh, I think it was mentioned earlier as well um, you know some uh, leasing options are being explored uh, you know you have private companies uh, that are kind of uh, you know coming into PPAs and so there, there are different ways in which it's happening but you know the challenge there is more on you know uh, how, how do you sort of handle you know the the different contracting. Uh, within the space, uh, within that. So, but but I, I would say in general, uh, you know, whether you look at, uh, you know, healthcare, whether you look at, uh, you know, the humanitarian uh, uh, support, and even, uh, you know, into the food and agriculture, where Irina is running some projects uh, in, in other parts of the world outside of SSA, uh, generally decentralized renewables are highly, uh, you know, they're, they're technically and financially viable. Um, you know, there are a lot of challenges on um, that we're facing or, you know, the, you can say for market development, I think a very critical part is building local entrepreneurship and sort of getting more, um, you know, local players involved in, in offering these kind of services. And, uh, you know, so, uh, so, so I, yeah, I think, um, but yeah, I would say that, you know, from a purely from a feasibility or you know viability perspective within the development field you know renewables are highly viable it's more about you know finding the right kind of uh, of, of business model and, and there are good examples it's mainly that you know you kind of have to have a fit for purpose uh, kind of model and uh, but, you know within that i mean it's it's we're seeing more and more deployment of renewables within these uh, fields thank you very good to know, uh, Ali, and I mean, I think uh, from what I can see, we could have a whole webinar about uh, deploying solar in humanitarian uh, settings. Oh, certainly, uh, certainly. Which we will be very happy to, to uh, organize maybe in the future. Um, I mean, I think uh, I want to focus on one thing that you, you mentioned, but you maybe you didn't really get to the, the bottom of. You, you, you mentioned that one of the main barriers, one of the main questions is how to handle the contracting within the uh, humanitarian crisis uh, setting. I mean, do you, it, we've spoken about this, but you know, maybe in more um, uh, stable uh, situations with, uh, you know, your, your PPAs, with CNI customers, with your, your um, customers of solar household systems. What is that like and how do you solve that in a humanitarian crisis? Yeah. Well, um, again, within the uh, humanitarian, I mean, there are different stages of uh, response. I mean, you have some which are, you know, clearly operating in a very high, highly kind of an emergency situation over there. It's very, it's, it'll be very, very difficult uh, to sort of, you know, have, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's really, you know, I, energy is not a priority immediately. It's more about, you know, providing security, keeping people alive, having food and uh, that, uh, you know, on the table, then you have a lot of these protracted situations where, you know, the settlement uh, is kind of, uh, you know, is, you know, has been around for a while and is expected to be around for a while. Uh, over there, uh, certainly, I think, you know, uh, there, there are, there's an increasing number of, um, you know, private uh, contractors or, you know, companies that are offering solutions. Um, a lot of them under, you know, uh, PPA basis, but in many cases, it's also, um, you know, you, you kind of have a combination, you know, of, uh, of leasing, uh, of uh, kind of rental agreements, as well as, you know, part ownership kind of models. But now what we explored uh, within, uh, you know, these camps that we, that we uh, carried out the assessments in, uh, in many of the cases, there's a good ca there's a good uh, sort of case for having, uh, you know, an on-site uh, system that could be connected to the grid as well. I mean, you know, 
provided how uh, on the proximity in Ethiopia particularly, I think it's something that it, it was a recommendation that we gave that it, that it's quite feasible for that particular uh, campsite to have a sort of a, a, you know a mini grid that is also connected to the grid and can also uh, subsequently uh, you know provide uh, electricity to the host community outside of the fence. Because again, you know, outside of that fence, you also have a community that is, uh, you know, lacking energy access. So over there, a public-private kind of mo model where, you know, you have UNHCR or, you know, the, uh, again, there within the campsite, there are different entities that are providing different solutions. So you could have one of the development agencies in partnership with a private company applying for a tariff and, uh, you know, sort of, a, a, you know, having a, a grid tied system that caters to the requirements of the community, but can all uh, requirements of the camp, but also can provide, can, you know, be expanded and provide uh, electricity to the host community, whereby, you know, the, the refugee agency becomes a bulk buyer, so to speak, and you kind of have a CNI model uh, serving the refugee settlement, but also the uh, host community. So, you know, these kind of hybrid approaches are sort of coming up, I think, within uh, uh, a recent study that was carried out by the United Nations uh, uh, UN-DOS uh, Department of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, uh, the name escapes me, but uh, uh, Department of Operational Services, who sort of oversee a lot of the uh, uh, humanitarian work and the peacekeeping operations, there is an increasing, uh, you know, push and realization towards, you know, having systems that, you know, can leave a positive legacy, uh, you know, whereby they, you know, provide power to these humanitarian operations, but also sort of uh, can, can provide energy to the host communities. So I think certainly, uh, you know, in, in some ways that CNI model of a bulk purchaser and, or I, I would say like of, a, of an anchor load and, you know, a mini grid that, you know, has an anchor mm -hmm. load. And then, uh, so I think in some ways or the other, that model is evolving within the space as well. Super. Uh, no, that's that sounds very very exciting, and indeed, uh, it seems like there's also a lot of uh, space for for both of the the uh, segments that we are uh, covering today to also uh, evolve within that uh, that space. Maybe I want to now turn to to Caroline, and I mean we're we're talking about uh, establishing uh, mini grids, and and that that makes me think of uh, your your. Uh, huge uh, experience uh, setting up uh, distributed energy services uh, companies across uh, across Africa. This is a business model that we haven't really uh, touched upon yet, but which is also extremely important to, to uh, accelerate uh, sustainable electrification and access to electricity. Um, can you tell us more about how, how they work and maybe uh, how they relate you know, to, to uh, what we've been discussing uh, previously? Yeah, thank you. Uh, but let me just uh, say something to reflect on what Ali said, because that's important. That's why I really emphasize uh, the, the and I really stress. Well, I'm happy that uh, you are uh, Arena is going to do a market study in the Burkina Faso on the health centers, because I'm working on different projects on connecting health centers uh, in different remote areas in different countries. And the, the, the biggest issue is uh, whether uh, the, the health centers own the system or you sign a PPA contract with them. Uh, it depends on what the, the, their affordability is. But I think the, 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 the biggest issue is that most of the health centers, uh, especially in the rural areas, they are often not paid by the Ministry of uh, Energies, like you also said. And uh, so you can even sign a PPA contract with them, but if they don't have even income, then uh, yeah, there's still a big uh, issue. So I think uh, if, if that kind of, uh, uh, and, and I, because I read also a lot of liter literature on it, and I think it's still uh, most of the, the, the systems uh, that are connected uh, to the health centers are still not uh, viable. So I think it's uh, really uh, good to uh, to look at this uh, this uh, aspect uh, in in your in your study in the Burkina Faso. 
um, that's one. Um, yeah, when when it relates to uh, distribute energy companies, well, the, the ones that I've been uh, um, uh, setting up and uh, still setting up some of them in different parts of Africa, um, we are talking about providing high quality services to peri-urban and uh, rural populations, either by mini grids uh, or solar home systems or a combination of mini grids and uh, solar home systems. And uh, we are really uh, providing, uh, well, the, the, the ones that I've been involved in in the past are providing high uh, requirements of uh, energy. Because I think from the from the from the moment uh, households and, and and businesses and uh, and and communities see the benefits of uh, getting access to energy, they see a lot of new opportunities when they have uh, access to electricity. So, uh, you know, uh, they start with uh, smaller pico systems, uh, bigger solar home systems, mini grids. So the the requirements are really inc increasing. The requirement, requirements for energy. Um, what we, what I see more and more is also um, um, uh, mini grid companies providing also, for example, uh, pulse products, uh, product, uh, the pulse products for the agro uh, sector for the 30 million um, farmers, smallholder farmers that are still not connected to energy. So uh, I think that's also a, a great benefit of uh, mini grid companies or uh, distribute energy companies, even pay as you go companies, is to provide uh, pill systems to uh, the millions of farmers that are still not uh, connected to the to the to energy services. Um, and in this in this case, pill systems. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, cold rooms, uh, irrigation systems. Uh, well, uh, there are a lot of uh, these appliances, and I think it's really uh, a growing uh, sector uh, where we, we we can still do a lot of uh, improvements. Um, that's one. Uh, at the same time, I see a combination of, uh, like some of my uh, fellow uh, participants in the panel said. I see a lot of opportunities also for uh, to have, and I think it's needed to have an anchor client like uh, uh, Telecom Tower, uh, te yeah, Telecom Tower as a uh, company as a client. That's something we are also looking into more and more. That's not easy, like um, some of my panelists also said. It's it's all about uh, signing or not a PPA. Most of them they don't want to own the asset, so they want to sign a PPA because that's really not, uh, you know. Uh, owning the, the, the and operating such system is not their business, so they just want to uh, transfer well to transfer the uh, uh, the ownership to uh, well the ownership not but uh, the, yeah they want to uh, not have the ownership of these uh, uh, solar systems and uh, and that uh, the fact that uh, like I said before signing a PPA uh, 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 coming to a certain tariff that reflects uh, the real cost. Um, and and uh, is 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 often not seen by the telecom company, uh, the telecom tower company as as uh, is also seen as an issue, because the the towers that uh, reflect the cost seem to to them too high, and um, yeah, so that makes it that most of uh, the, the 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 agreements are still not uh, yet uh, signed. And um, that's something that we are still uh, struggling with, uh, and it takes a lot of a long, long time to do it. At the same time, what I see, and that's important, uh, especially in my last contacts with some Nigerian companies, is that um, uh, I think the next generation, or even the, the current generation of rural utilities, are customer centric. Uh, decentralized, uh, flexible service providers that can own much more of the customer value chain beyond only a basic electricity connection. So what we see is uh, the value stacking. So they are adding services such as uh, different financial products, different uh, financial uh, payment uh, opportunities. Um, they offered, like I said, pulse uh, systems, uh, money, uh, mobile money uh, opportunities, but also mobile uh, membership 
uh, telecom uh, mobile uh, memberships opportunity. So I think that the, what we see more and more and what we have to do is uh, working much more with, of course, over this, the sectors, working with the digital sector, the interconnect connectivity sector, the productivity sector, and the energy sector. I think if we work much more together, we can uh, reach much more results and we can advance much faster the energy access because uh, to my, according to my opinion, we are not advancing so fast. But if we want to get uh, to, to 2030 universal access to energy, we have to cooperate much more between the, the, the different sectors. The crossover is important and, um, and uh, increasing the productivity opportunities for many clients. You know, uh, I'm, we are now uh, going to set up some um, uh, green business areas in the peri-urban or in the periphery of villages. We are going to set up uh, green business areas to, and they are already existing, for example, in Mali, where a lot of uh, entrepreneurs get the opportunity to be uh, connected to a reliable power uh, opportunity uh, capacity, but at the same time they get um, they get um, um, uh, how do you say um, and, uh, support Caroline, can, in their business. Can you, can you, can you please uh, finish uh, or close your yeah. remarks? Or yeah. yeah. So uh, just to say that there are green green, green business opportunities. Uh, there are agro processing uh, industry areas uh, going to be set up also. So if we combine the digitalization with interconnectivity, with productivity and energy, we can advance much more access uh, energy access in the field. Thanks, uh, Caroline. I mean, I, I really like how you you've drawn uh, again the the parallels across uh, the different nexus. Uh, particularly the, the uh, food, water, energy uh, nexus, which uh, uh, is a uh, key in, in rural uh, settings. Um, and particularly with, with your concept of a value second, which I think is, is at the end of the, 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 uh, the basis of all the, the business models which we have uh, been discussing uh, today. Um, one key question from, from the, um, uh, the audience uh, to you, Caroline, real quick really quickly could you please clarify the term uh, pills because i'm not sure if it, it was clear productive for use that, that means productive use leveraging solar energy productive use so solar for energy solar for, energy. Uh, productivity for increasing productivity like for example in the field for farmers yep super uh very very relevant uh, as well uh for the different uh next i identified by by ali I want to, to close uh, the panel with a really, really quick uh, round of questions to, to you all. Uh, I will uh, proceed uh, in, in uh, the order that I can see on, on the slide. Uh, so for you, what is a key word uh, to define the contribution of solar to uh, SDG uh, 7? And I will start with you, Ali. I mean, can you be re very quick, please? Well, um... I would say that, you know, the biggest contribution within the SE would be enabler, you know, enabler for poverty alleviation, enabler for universal access to uh, energy, enabler for, you know, uh, universal health coverage. So I think solar and, and energy in general, you know, it's, it's, it's a key enabler for these, for sustainable development. It's, uh, you know, livelihoods are linked with it, you know, jobs, uh, productive yeah. uses, uh, you know, so, I would say that if, if it's in, in I, cognizant of the time, I would, you know, I would stop here. So, you know, Super. that that would be for the keyword from my side. Uh, very good uh, keyword, uh, Caroline. For you. Uh, well, it's just uh, alleviating, uh, getting uh, out people of out of poverty. That's for me the most important. Just uh, enhancing uh, the life of so many millions of people. Fantastic. Very good uh, takeaway. Leticia, for you? Sure. Um, my word is uh, present. Uh, I think we want, we all want to prove that solar is not the, the future of Africa, but it's there already. And Africa doesn't have to wait uh, years and years to, to have solar uh, reducing the, the, the carbon footprint of uh, the current energy production there. Love that as well. Indeed, we are providing solutions right now. Rupesh? I'd say solar is probably the quickest and cheapest way to 
to meeting SDG 7 requirements in Africa? Perfect. And indeed, as uh, probably echoing uh, what has been uh, said by Leticia. And uh, last but not least, uh, Rolake, what is your keyword? I'd say access in three ways. Access to the solar system. So reaching people in peri-urban or urban areas who would otherwise not see solar. I'd say access to credit. So enabling low-income customers to afford the product by extending them loans and especially for productive use, as Caroline mentioned. Um, and I'll say access to finance. So for companies to be able to raise the finance they need to effectively scale, because the prior to cannot be done unless this is taken as a long-term goal um, to really scale up and reach um, the areas that are lacking electricity um, and really need it. Fantastic. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. And indeed, uh, it is clear that uh, on-site solar uh, can uh, very, very much be um, the a key enabler and, and supporter of, uh, of achieving uh, SDG uh, 7 uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa and obviously uh, beyond. Um, I'd like to, to thank you all again for, for your time, uh, for taking uh, my questions and uh, for your very very good insights um just to to remind everyone that uh, a recording of this uh, webinar will be uh, shared uh shortly after after the the webinar and uh yes on that uh, note uh, oh yeah we we want to to uh, make everyone aware of uh, our two uh main events uh, coming up uh shortly in april and uh, 21st 22nd of april intersolar intersolar summit in spain and on the 10th uh, to 12th of May, uh, our very own Solar Power Summit, in which we will also be uh, looking at our work on international cooperation. Um, if you would like to uh, uh, get in touch and enhance your digital presence, uh, do not hesitate to get in touch uh, with us and with my colleague, Manuele Poli, as you can see on your screens uh, right now. Um, I think that gets us to to the end of the of the webinar uh thank you all again uh i wish you a very uh, sunny rest of the day uh and look forward to talking to you in the future thank, thank you. you thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank you everyone Bye. thanks bye-bye okay.